Our topic for this session will be subdural hemorrhage. Our first case is a relatively straightforward case of a parafalsing subdural. You see the widening and increased density of the falx, which generally is at least somewhat dense. Here you can follow it throughout its course. It is too prominent, but certainly these are missed with some frequency. So again, a classic case of a parafalsing subdural hemorrhage. Our next case is another typical location for subdural hemorrhage, and that's along the tentorium. It's symmetry that really helps you here. See a nice asymmetric thickening and increased density in that left tentorium compared to the right. So that again is a typical tentorial subdural hemorrhage. Our next case is a typical convexity subdural, this one post-traumatic again. You can see it here, relatively thin and somewhat irregular. It is not the most obvious thing, but certainly not of such subtlety that it would necessarily be missed. You can see the subdurals, of course, cross suture lines, this one extending over the temporal pole there. But the more important finding here is actually this one. There is soft tissue gas at the skull base, suggesting either a soft tissue laceration or a skull fracture with communication to the sinuses. You can see that is, in fact, the case here. There is a linear lucency, hypodensity, there in the petrous portion of the temporal bone. This is what's known as a longitudinal fracture along the long axis of the petrous portion of the temporal bone as opposed to a transverse. These longitudinal fractures are particularly associated with ossicular disruption. Compare the ossicles to the opposite side. Pretty impressive. The malleus and the incus are not aligned as they should be and this obviously does result in conductive hearing loss. The transverse temporal bone fractures, in contrast, will result in sensorineural loss and disruption of the otic capsule. There is that soft tissue gas. And rather quickly going by, that linear fracture line and dissociation of the ossicles. So that is a convexity subdural hemorrhage with an associated temporal bone fracture and ossicular disruption. There is a final magnified view of those dissociated ossicles. Our next case is a rather tragic abuse case with multifocal subdural hemorrhage. Essentially, this infant has manifested subdural hemorrhage wherever it is possible to do so. So you can see here there is asymmetric left tentorial thickening and density consistent with subdural hemorrhage. Here overlying the convexity, and note as well the mix of densities there is hyperdense fluid overlying the convexities in a much larger distribution than that small focus of hyperdensity, suggesting a more acute hemorrhage. But these combined findings suggest multiple injuries throughout time. There is parafalsine density. Lastly, let's note that there is cortical hypodensity in multiple 
levels throughout this case. You can see them in the temporal regions here and occipital, and here in the parietal regions as well as frontal. They are essentially along a watershed distribution and are consistent with ischemic injury from strangling. Here as well, parafalsine and convexity densities, consistent with more subdural hemorrhage. So here is the tentorial density. And here the convexity density. Notice again the increased density overlying both frontal convexities, parafalsine, and convexity and falsine. Note again throughout the cortical hypodensities consistent with ischemic injury. So this is a case of multifocal subdural hemorrhage but with associated ischemic injury related to strangling. Our next case is the bane of all emergency teleradiologists, the isodense subdural hemorrhage. Note there is a crescentic hypodensity overlying the right frontal cortical convexities. And there is a slight leftward shift of midline structures. On the movie version you can see present throughout that overlying hypodensity, sort of crescentic in distribution, slightly displacing the right frontal cortex away from the inner table. A very subtle finding, but one hopefully your attention would be called to by the presence of that midline shift. So that is an isodense subdural hemorrhage. Our next case is a posterior fossa subdural hemorrhage. As you might expect with this particular location of hemorrhage, there is a great deal of increased intracranial pressure with herniation of the cerebellar tonsils you see here in the foramen magnum. There are extraaxial hyperdense fluid collections with layering density overlying both cerebellar hemispheres. Again, an unusual location for a subdural hemorrhage, but one predictably associated with hydrocephalus. Let's note again that tonsillar herniation with the cerebellar tonsils extending down into the foramen magnum. And here are those extraaxial fluid collections with layering density overlying and displacing, compressing the cerebellar hemispheres. Note the absence of the fourth ventricle. So that is an unusual case of a posterior fossa subdural hemorrhage with tonsillar herniation. Our next case is a subdural hemorrhage with subfalsine herniation. You can see a large extraaxial density here overlying the right temporal region. In addition, there are interpeduncular, paramesencephalic cistern, and dependent intraventricular densities, as well as marked dilation of the left lateral ventricle. On the next cut up, you can see the dread complication of subfalsine herniation. This hypodensity represents anterior right frontal cortex, which has herniated past the falcs and has become ischemic. You see it again here on the next cut up, really appreciating that segment of ischemic cortex bridges and bends around the falx. Lastly, the highest cut shows again that ischemic subfalsine herniation. So the displacement of the frontal cortex underneath the falcs 
tends to compress the anterior cerebral arteries, resulting in cortical infarcts of either the herniated uh, or the opposite side frontal cortex. So that is a subfalcine herniation with associated anterior cerebral artery territory infarct. Our next case is of uncle herniation related to a subdural hemorrhage. This subdural is of mixed density consistent with repeated episodes of hemorrhage over time, though there is a hyperdense and thus acute element present here. This is causing significant mass effect with medial displacement of the uncus, which you see here compressed against many adjacent structures. There's dilation of the right lateral ventricle related to effacement and occlusion at the foramen of Monroe. There is also dilation of the left ventricle. Note this is the inferior horn, which you see markedly narrowed at the tip of the arrow. But medial to that arrow, there is dilation of the tip of the inferior horn. This is known as a trapped horn and is related to the herniation of the uncus compressing that portion of the inferior horn. Note also, in the hypodense brainstem, there is central hyperdensity. This is consistent with intraparenchymal hemorrhage and is known as a dure hemorrhage related to ischemic damage to the brainstem. So let's look first at the uncle herniation and trapped horn. Note that pinched, narrowed portion of the inferior horn and dilation just in its tip within that herniated portion of the uncus. And then let's look at the hypodense brainstem with its central dure hemorrhage. So that is a case of subdural hemorrhage with associated uncal herniation, trapped horn, and dure hemorrhage of the brainstem. And that concludes this session on subdural hemorrhage.